It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. I'm excited to talk with my guest today. Joining me is Brandon Reglinger from Persist IQ. Now, there continues to be an incredible amount of innovation in the whole sales technology space. New applications, new uses of technologies, sometimes what we call sales hacks, if you will, are appearing daily. And the goal for most of these is to increase both the efficiency and the effectiveness of your sales efforts. And define, I define effectiveness in sales being doing the right thing, and efficiency is doing the right thing right. And right in the case of sales is how do you generate more revenue per hour of selling time? So a good question to ask is, what's in your sales stack? Or what should be in your sales stack to improve your sales productivity? And our guest today, Brandon Redlinger, is going to help us sort sort that all out. Brandon, welcome to the show. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Andy. Well, so thanks for being here. So tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, so um, a little bit about me. I, before I got into sales, I was actually um, a health and wellness uh, professional, professional um, personal trainer. I, I was uh, training professional and semi-professional triathletes, and then really, uh, I didn't to, know that. Yeah, yeah. So I, a past life, I was kind of this health nut, this health guru, and I was trying to actually get my business off the ground itself. And I thought that all I had to do was get my nutrition certifications, my health coach certifications, all these trainings done, hang my shingle out, and people would come to me. And (laughs) not quite the case. So, (laughs) you know, struggled a little bit um, and then kind of fell into uh, the more business side of things. And that's when I really kind of fell in love with, with sales and marketing. And then from there, I dove like head in and... Um, almost to the point where I started to neglect my uh, the, the personal training, the health side of things, and got all the way into the business side. Got a job in New York in sales, and that was kind of my introduction, um, doing health and wellness sales in New York. Did that for a while, you know, went through the whole SDR track, mm-hmm, then mm-hmm. was an AE for a while, and then uh, lead AE, um, and then wanted to uh, shift my focus a little bit to the marketing side of things to get a really full rounded education on on business growth. So took over the marketing for uh, a small startup, and then did that for a few years. Then jumped over to Persistent IQ where I help on the the sales and the marketing side. So I lot, do a lot of the marketing efforts, but um, a lot of what we do too involves me on the sales side. Right, and then that whole process you sort of neglected to mention that you then moved from New York to California. That is correct. So I am in the Bay Area now. Got it. And have you completely neglected your health now as being in a startup? Or are you a couch potato and, or are you still <laughs> able to be engaged in your fitness activities? I, I still work out six days a week. I luckily have um, a girlfriend who is just as committed to health as I am. And um, she actually went through a few trainings herself. So if it, I think if it weren't for her, possibly I could easily get lost in that, you know? <laughs> All right. Well, I asked that question, even though I, <laughs> we've met before, so I know that you, you work out, but <laughs> I thought I'd just throw that out there. So, so yes. let's, let's talk about the sales stack. So yes. we talked about that in the open to the show. I think this is a term that a lot of sales leaders and entrepreneurs and, and business owners and so on are, are unfamiliar with, but it's, it's gaining a lot of currency. And it's important, I think, they understand what it is. So what what is a sales stack? Yeah, sales stack is really the technology, the tools that a sales team uses to effectively execute against their sales process. So it's really helping you um, be more effective and more efficient um, in their selling process. And it's not just just one application. That has, hence, the stack. It's a... It could be more than one. It could be a series of of sales technologies, sales applications that you use. That's exactly it. Yep. So it's not a replacement for a sales process, though. 
No, it, it always starts with the sales process. And I think a lot of people kind of do it backwards, right? They, they go out there, they're looking at the new te- tools, the new technologies that are popping up every day. And um, I, I know the lure of that because there are so many cool things going on out there with technology advancing so much right now in the sales space that they kind of get distracted and they get drawn away from what really matters, which again is the sales process. So I always think it, it starts with the process and then whichever tools help you execute the best against your process is really how you should be building your sales stack, not let's go find the tools and then kind of figure out our process from there. So how does someone define, well, first, how do they define their needs? I guess, you know, it's one thing to have a process, but I, I think it's a little a stretch for some people to be able to understand, okay, we've got this process, but how do we overlay the technology to it? So how, how does somebody that's really not so familiar with this, how do they go about defining what their needs are? And then secondly is how do they prioritize which part of the stack comes first? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's, um, it really is trying to figure out you know, where you are in the market and really, um, I I guess, um, kind of breaking it down into, okay, what are our goals and how we really going to get there? Um, you know, so for, for us, we try to keep it really as simple as possible. And, you know, we have our, our SDRs and we have our AEs and we have our CSN or customer success managers Mm -hmm. and account managers. Um, and then it's, it's really breaking that out. Okay, what are the jobs to be done by each of those? Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and, you know, of course, working off of our metrics and how are they going to achieve those metrics? And then um, kind of giving them the tools to help do their job more effectively, more efficiently. And between your SDRs, your AEs, customer success managers, assume somebody has that sales development sales model, do you prioritize, and you don't have unlimited resources, mm-hmm. in your case, I'm going to take your case, Persist IQ, mm-hmm. how do you prioritize where you're going to invest the technology in first? Is it in the SDRs, so, you know, developing the prospects, or is it in the AEs? I mean, how, how do you make that decision? Uh, that, that's a really good question. So I think it, it comes back to, um, so we, we always start with kind of the, the CRM, right? So that's the system of record. That's a place where the SDR, the AE, the CSM, any management can go um, look at an account and figure out where it is at in the sales process and kind of what's going on. So So, CRM sort of becomes the base of the sales stack for most companies? Yeah, I I think it has to be, right? Okay. So that is the one place where it should be consistent across all of your your roles. So to figure out what's going on, all they have to do is jump into the CRM itself um, and... You know, setting up this your CRM correctly in the first place um, it is very important too. A lot of people just throw things together, try to figure out how it goes. But I think you know, it, it get, again, it goes back to like sales process. Let's make sure our CRM fits the sales process, and then from there, you can start to layer on top. You know, build that sales stack. Okay, great. Now, once we have our CRM in place. Um, the first step is to generate leads. All right, what's going to be the m- most effective tool that's going to help us generate our leads? Are we uh, an inbound or an outbound model? Um, and then from there, um, it you know, goes over to the AEs. And the AEs, how can they most effectively uh, you know, demo the product? How can they effectively send out uh, you know, their sales collateral? How can they effectively send out their contracts, get those back? How can... You know the the customer success team now effectively track the the engagement of your users or maybe people on a trial, um, and then really onboard them easily and and help them become successful at what they do. So I think that's what it's all about, right? Is is helping your customers be successful and enjoy the process. Right. And so taking a step back, said so CRM sort of the base level of the stack mm-hmm. is. It seems like really critical at that at that step that to make sure that, as you said, that it's configured appropriately for what you're doing, but also that there is adoption, mm-hmm. <laughs> uniform adoption of yeah. the technology across your sales force. Because if you start adding onto the stack and and your team isn't using your CRM system the way that you've set it up to be used, 
then you've got a real problem. Yes. So yeah, adoption is definitely a tricky thing. And um, one, one of the things that, you know, at Persist IQ, how we built our product for adoption was we, we really wanted a clean, simple, intuitive UI, right? So it's, um, we, we put a lot of effort into building our product and making it intuitive and easy for the end user to actually use. So that's one thing that people love about our tool over some of the others out there, our platform, is um, that an SDR, a new SDR just coming on, can easily just um, ramp up really quick. So they don't have to spend you know, months training on the, on the platform. It's actually pretty intuitive how to set it up, how to actually get their work done every day. So I think the, the tools that get easily adopted are the, the simpler tools, the, the tools that um, don't overcomplicate things, don't put extra bells and whistles, don't put extra distractions in place. Um, and, and then you'll be able to use your, your platform more effectively in your sales process. Well, you sort of touch on what, something I think is really a key point, which is that you know, if you're a business owner, CEO, sales leader, you're evaluating what are the right set of tools to you. And let's start with, hopefully you're just looking at one to start with. Um, yeah, identifying those things that, that uh, as you start, that should be too sort of like easy to use, easy to train people on. It has to be something that, that you have to be able to measure pretty quickly whether or not it's doing the task that you set out to for it to, to do, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So I, I think that's really a critical thing that, that a lot of times companies don't really understand because there's a real opportunity cost to you if you make the wrong choice and you've implemented mm-hmm. a solution, especially if you're a small business or you're a startup, because you could have the, really, the real risk of losing some serious momentum in the marketplace. You wouldn't necessarily think so, but you can if your CRM system and you sort of depend on it just isn't functioning or isn't being used the way it needs to be used. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And I think, have you ever done the exercise of, um, it, it's been done with like stones in a jar before where you like, you put all the small stones in first and then you put the medium sized ones in and then, you know, the big ones don't fit in and then, you know, you pour them all out. Then you start with the big stones and then the medium stones, and then you put the small stones in to fill, kind of fill in all the little cracks and then everything, you know, fits in that jar. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I think the same thing kind of goes with, with your sales stack, right? You put the major building blocks in first, and then you start to fill in with some of the smaller tools. And then you'll end up, you know, adding these sort of like nice to haves at the end. So maybe, you know, maybe it's an email finder, or maybe it's, you know, this little Chrome extension that kind of gives you a little bit more speed when you're prospecting or, or whatever it may be. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's really starting with those, those building blocks first. And, and then kind of adding the smaller pieces in, kind of filling in the cracks. Well, one of the questions I get a lot of the time from the people that listen to the show and, and people that you know, follow me on, on social media and other places is, is that they're, you know, they're intrigued by you know, a lot of these tools that are coming out, like Persist IQ. Mm-hmm. But it seems like their only choice if they want to use Persist IQ is they have to adopt Salesforce.com. Which, you know, is a great system, but for some, you know, companies of a certain size, it, it could be overkill for what they need. Um, and yet, a lot of the apps don't integrate with anything other than, than Salesforce. So, what's your sort of response to that? Yeah, um, I, I, th- I think it goes back to, again, just figuring out what, what's going to be the best for, for you and your company at that stage. So, yeah, maybe you're not quite ready for a Salesforce.com. You might need to go with something a little smaller, maybe a little lighter weight built for a smaller sales team. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's closed.io. And a lot, of, um, a lot of technologies out there do have other integrations, whether it be through Zapier or maybe it's they have like persons like you has an open API. So, you, you know, you and your sales team can dev out in integration. Um, so, you know, it, it really is becoming easier to patch together all these tools so that they can talk to each other. Um, but yeah, if, if Salesforce isn't right for you, then don't feel pressured to go with Salesforce or go with one of these 
these you know bigger name brands. So what you're saying is that, and just to make clear for people listening, is that increasingly, you know, platforms like Persist IQ, you said, have an open API, so that you can farm out a development to integrate with some other CRM platform that may be more tailor made for what what you do. Maybe something that has a you know like a vertical market oriented CRM. You want to use Persist IQ and the CRM. There's a way to make that happen. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Sales not you know made based on the tools. It's made through the process that the reps and, and the company uses, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the tools just make it a little bit more scalable, a little bit more manageable. Like it. Okay, great. Well, we're going to come right back. We're going to talk some about Persist IQ when we come back with my guest, Brandon Redlinger. And we'll be right back. Stay with us. Hi, this is Andy. Connect and Sell is used by sales reps at nearly a thousand companies, including hundreds of technology startups and several Fortune 500 companies, to overcome the challenges of getting prospects on the phone. Companies using Connect and Sell grow their revenues faster by enabling their sales reps to have more sales conversations in 90 minutes than they could otherwise achieve in an entire week. Connect and Sell can be deployed directly to your sales reps, or you can take advantage of their outbound on-demand service, which delivers qualified prospect meetings scheduled directly on your sales reps' calendars. Visit connectandsell.com to learn more about how Connect and Sell can start filling your pipeline today. All right, welcome back. I'm talking with my guest, Brandon Redlinger from Persist IQ. We've been talking about how you build your sales stack. And yeah, I know this is something that can be a bit confusing for a company that's sort of wading into the, the technology pool. Um, it's interesting, you know, given sort of the amount of specialization that, that's occurring, it seems like in the sales process, right? I mean, we've got, especially in the SaaS space, software as a service space, you know, you've got the sales development model, like all with SDRs doing the prospecting, setting up appointments, the AEs, Taking it through to a close and customer success and account managers handling it after the fact, after the fact and handling renewals and upsells and cross sells. It seems like there's starting to be some overlap between technologies. You know, for instance, like uh, email tracking applications, mm-hmm. um, like Yesware or Tout app that you know maybe do pre schedule and automate emails. And then there's these sales development platforms, which Persist IQ is one that, you know, you can set up automated workflows and, and mm-hmm. email campaigns. <clears throat> and then we've got marketing automation, you know, systems out there that sort of support the same functionality. So, you know, what's, what's going to happen here? What's, what's your vision of the future in terms of uh, how this all sort of gets sorted out? Because increasingly there's sort of, like I said, overlap and intersections since all these various types of platforms. Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, where is this space going? Um, I, I think you're right. It seems like everyone is trying to, to do all things. And they want to do it across, uh, you know, from start to finish. You know, start being generating the leads to finish all the way to closing and maybe even, um, you know, maintaining those accounts. But um, I think the future really lies in, like, making sure one company does their one job really well before moving on to something else. So in this space, we've seen a lot of people try to do all things, but they do all things, you know, just okay. Right. And that's, that's kind of why the space is getting really crowded, in my opinion. So I think, you know, do one thing really well at first and then kind of start to move on to, okay, great, how can we help help the reps be again more successful at what they're doing and then maybe it's maybe it's starting to you know overlap into you know so we're really built for an SDR as i mentioned mm-hmm. but maybe we start to once we nail that maybe we start to build out more functionality for the AE and once we really nail that maybe we can you know move on to you know customer success or whatever so how would you give guidance then to somebody that's that's uh, you know looking at making this investment in their sales stack? They've got their CRM system. They're now saying, okay, yeah, you know, we're going to take the next next level up. <laughs> Maybe they were looking at email tracking, but they say, oh, I can get email tracking in my sales development platform. And how, given this, how do they how do they sort it out? What would you give them? Sort of the one or two key things they should look at if they're evaluating a product service in this space to help them make a decision about which way to go. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think we already kind of hit it on the head with, uh, just like 
matching your sales process and then making sure you know the your your people adopt it correctly um i mean other than that i i don't think there's that much use for you know trialing every single thing out there um and spending too much time evaluating everything because mm-hmm. i think i i think there is something to be said for like let's just implement this and and um and figure out how we can best utilize this. Because I think, especially in an early stage company, it matters what you spend your time doing. So, you know, if you spend your time, you know, months trying to play around with this one tool and then they figure out, um, you know, maybe want, we want to try something else and they spend months trying to implement something else and change the process. And that's a lot of time wasted for a company. So I think there is like a balance, right? So let's let's actually just choose something that we think works best right now and fully implement it and fully get on board rather than, all right, let's play around with all of these things. Because we've run into companies before that, you know, are trying five different tools at once at the same time <laughs> as Persist IQ. Right. That's not helpful for them. No, and it's, I, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's a, a trap a lot of companies fall into, a lot of individuals fall into, which is trying to get the perfect solution when there's no real incremental value or marginal value that you get from choosing what you think is the perfect thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. I think there's a yeah, diminishing return on your time at some point. So I think you really just got to commit and go. And then, you know, maybe a few, uh, you know, a few quarters later, you reevaluate. Um, and, you know, as your team grows, as your company grows, and as the market changes, maybe, maybe, the tool or the platform that works best for you does change, but I, I wouldn't really try to <laughs> change it too frequently, you know? No, no. All right. I think it's good. Good answer in terms of not being too hung up on, on perfection. So, um, so let's talk for a second about Persist IQ and how it fits into the sales stack. Mm-hmm. So, so if you've got your CRM system and you're focused on your SDRs, Persist IQ, then surely it's something that's sort of one of the first things you'd look at in terms mm-hmm. of helping support your ability to prospect. Yep, exactly. So Persist IQ is all about your outbound sales, trying to get in touch with those leads. And we really built um, a, a good use case right now for Persist IQ is these more targeted accounts selling. So that's kind of a, a hot topic right now. Something that we're really diving into is more your... Um, account-based sales, account-based sales development. Uh, I've heard it being called a lot these days. So um, it's all about um, trying to target the right people and, and really balancing personalization with automation. So a lot of people these days are obsessed about, like, let's automate, let's automate, let's automate. You know, all of these amazing tools to help us automate everything. But I think we are over-automating and actually... Um, stripping out the human element. And, and that's really what makes a great salesperson a great salesperson aside from just a good salesperson, right? They have that, um, that human touch, that real ability to connect with others. So that's the key to these more targeted account selling models um, rather than just complete over-automation. Because everyone knows these days when they get an automated email or an automated voicemail, right? Um, and that that just kills the deal. So we are again trying to balance automation with the human side of things. So how do you do that? So how, give me an example of how that works with Persist IQ. Yeah. So Persist IQ, you know, um, queues up all of your outbound, you know, say emails that you're going to be doing. And then it will run that mail merge. But before you send that mail merge out, you're able to review each individual email and jump in there. And, you know, maybe, maybe you're in one of my campaigns, Andy, and, you know, we, we saw each other at Saster. Before I send that out, I can actually jump in there and say, oh, great conversation at Saster. You know, this is my takeaway from our conversation. Um, and then send that out. And you know that that was actually a personalized email. Because I can't say... Great seeing you at Saster to another lead, right? Because it, it wouldn't make any sense. So it's you know being relevant and and um, fitting within the context. Yeah, now this whole issue of personalization is one that is a big one for me because yeah, I mean there's sort of simple levels of personalization. Hey, you put somebody's you know first name in, 
but is there, I mean, even something, the example you gave, I mean, yeah, I got, I went to Saster at this conference. I got a bunch of emails from people that seemingly are personalized, but the fact is all they've done is scan my badge, right? You're right. So, and they referred to the conversation they had at Saster, which, you know, there was no conversation. Um, <laughs> great talking to you at the booth, Andy. Yeah, great talking to you at the booth. Exactly. By. That's a quote unquote from people yep. I, I never spoke with. So, yep. um, how do you make that personalization relevant in a way that, that people really see that it's, it is personalized? And I think that's one of the real challenges here for, for sales development platforms. And I'm interested in your take on that. Yeah, so um, I think the way we approach it, at least, is we want to make sure we do enough research on the prospect, or if we're at Saster or any other conference talking to people, we want to take as much as many notes as possible so that we can bring up the right things in our follow up, so that it is obvious that we we are personalizing these emails that we are trying to connect with people at a real human level so um it it, it's going back to um kind of kind of what you said a little earlier right there's the the distinction that i make is customization is different than personalization so anyone can customize an email anyone can run a mail merge and fill in first name and, and company but if you I think recipients obviously know that they, they can read an email and be like, oh, they all they did is switch out this first name with my first name, right? And it doesn't feel personal, though it may look like a personal email. It doesn't feel personal. So um, to really personalize instead of just customize, um, it really is knowing knowing your audience, knowing who you're actually sending it to. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, there... If you're following up from a conference like Sasser, where you have a lot of notes, it is a little easier to do. But if you are doing just a pure cold outbound email campaign, then you might have to spend a little bit more time prospecting, a little bit more time on their social media profiles or, or whatever, doing that research to dig up information to make it relevant. So, Yeah, um, I think that's really a key point. Is, is It's that extra level of effort that the rep has to, has to put into it. I mean, it doesn't have to be half an hour. It can be a few minutes, less than a few minutes. Right, exactly. Just visit the social profiles, go to LinkedIn. And, you know, maybe it's what I like to do is, and is in those cases, is, yeah, I want to try to find that one detail that will tell the person that I did actually look at something about them. Exactly. Right? I mean, it could be, it could be something as mundane as, as talking about the weather where they are. I mean, I mean, if you want to take a really simple, banal, sort of semi-banal example, mm-hmm. but it, it does work because people understand that there was that one extra level of effort that was put into it. Or maybe it's something, you know, they're, they're the sports teams they follow or, you know, something like that on, that you found from their Facebook page. Just that one little tidbit can make a huge difference. Yeah, because, it, you know, as I always like to say, it's you don't have to be... 10% different or 15% different or 50% different than your competition, 1% different is, is sufficient enough. Right, exactly. And, and I, I think um, being genuine, too, is, um, is going to be a key part of it because uh, I, I think a lot of people, especially if you're selling to other salespeople, they can kind of call you out on it sometimes. I was, I was at Saster and I saw a guy wearing a New York Rangers hat and I was like, yeah, go Rangers. And he was like, are you saying that just to get me to come over here and talk? I was like, no, I'm actually a Ranger fan. He's like, okay, name, name five players on the team. <laughs> well, this guy's, and, a real, this guy's a real cynic. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, totally. But I, I think that's, sometimes that's how us salespeople are, right? And, and luckily enough, I am actually a huge Ranger fan. I was able to name five and, and more players on the team and then start to talk to him about uh, you know, a recent trade that they had and how they're doing in the playoff race. Um, and then actually that, actually connecting with him, opened him up. And then we got to talking about business and, and how Persist IQ might be able to help his team. Right, So I think it's actually being genuine at the same time. So it's not just like, Hey, I saw you're, um, you know, you're from Arizona and you're, you're a big um, Arizona State University fan. 
you know, I, I hear they're doing really well right now. Go, you know, Wildcats or whatever it is, you know? Sun Devils, just to let you know. Sun Devils, sorry. <laughs> Wildcats are Aaron University of Arizona. University of Arizona. Okay, let's go. be careful before you talk to somebody in Arizona. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's go to the last segment of the show as I've got some standard questions I ask all my guests. And the first one is a hypothetical scenario that I ask okay. everyone is, you've just been hired as a new sales leader at a company whose sales have stalled out, they're stuck, and CEO really wants things to get turned around in a hurry. So what two things would you do your first week on the job that would have the biggest impact? Yeah, um, so I think, I think the most important thing that you can do hmm, is really understand like why, why, sales have, why sales have stalled, right? Why things aren't working. You can't come in and expect a quick fix. You can't, you know, put a Band-Aid over the problem and expect um, to get those results. So I, I think getting to the root of the problem really helps you make a lasting impact. It will really help turn sales around. And I think, generally speaking, um, it, it's going to be a, a process problem or a people problem, right? Mm -hmm. So the way I look at it is let's, all right, let's first start off with the process. And this is kind of what we've been talking about all along, right? And do we have the right sales process in place? A lot of times I think people, you know, a sales process is going to be a lot different at a company that's at 1 million ARR than a company that's at 100 million, right? right? But a lot of times people at that 100 million ARR mark is using the same process as they were at that 1 million. So let's make sure we are using the right sales process. And then from there, you can kind of drill down a little bit and get a little bit more focus. You know, let's look at the health of the pipeline. Let's look at our pipeline metrics. Uh, let's make sure we're getting quality opportunities. And then, you know, once the process is in place, do we have the right people to execute against the process? Uh, and then are we giving our tools, are we giving our reps the right tools? Um, and are they following the process for each of those tools? So I think first it's starting off at making sure we have the right sales process in place, and then going to um, people, right? Do we have the right people in place to execute against the process or our strategy? Is everyone on the same team? You know, do they work cohesively together mm -hmm. as a team? Mm -hmm. um, is everyone on the same page? You know, is everyone bought into the company? I think also there's, there's something to be said about company culture, right? Um, and then there are some more soft skills. Do they enjoy their job? Do they have friends at work? Do they feel valued at work? Um, are, there, are their voices heard? I think those are, are really important things that make reps happy at work. And we all know happy reps actually uh, end up performing better. Um, and in order to solve the, the people in the process problem, I, I think you're going to need some, some, some help. And I would start by talking with maybe some mid-level managers because I think generally they have a good idea of what's going on in the company. And, and you have to be careful with like bureaucracy and, and biases. But you know, take everyone's thoughts in and try to objectively discern what's useful with the information that you get and, and how to move forward. Because I, th I think it would be foolish for someone to think that they can just go into a company and turn around things on the very first day, right? Right. And frankly, I'd be a little skeptical myself of if someone came into Persist IQ and thought that they could turn something, turn the company around on day one. So uh, going in, talking with a lot of people, and then taking that information, in, and then from there figuring out, all right, do we have the right processes and do we have the right people? Okay. All right, good. So uh, some... Sort of rapid fire questions. You can give me one word answers if you want, or you can elaborate. So mm -hmm. the first one is is when you, Brandon, are out selling, what's your most powerful sales attribute? Um, I I think it's curiosity. Um, and asking the right questions. And that's kind of the same thing, curiosity. Okay. Who's your sales role model? Uh, many, many sales role models over the years. Um I one that I keep coming back to, he's actually kind of an older school sales guy, more of a direct sales. I uh, started it out in even MLM, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Dan Kennedy. Dan Kennedy, okay. Yeah. Almost more of a marketing type guy from my perspective. Yeah. 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 I, think, I think he started off as a sales guy more on the marketing side, but um, also just kind of 
entrepreneurial in general. Right. So what's one sales, one book, not sales book, but one book every salesperson should read, whether it's sales book or not? Um, one, but hopefully they're reading more than one book, right? But I think um, one of the ones that really got me started was Influence by Robert Cialdini. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of sales has to do with behavioral psychology, and I think that is the best book out there to start understanding um, behaviors and why people act the way they act. Okay, great choice. So what music's on your playlist right now? What music's on my playlist? That's, that's a great question. That my, my playlist is, um, first, it, it's pretty small because I don't listen to that much music. I'm more of a podcast, more of an audiobook kind of guy. But um, I have a little bit of everything. And um, I'm kind of one of those guys who kind of likes to listen to, to music on loop. All right. right. So, what's, so what's, what's on the loop? Give us a, give us a name. Um, right now, it's, it's Fight Song by Rachel Platten. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Well, that's that's going to be memorialized. Hope you're okay with that. That's going on the website. <laughs> so, fight song. Okay. Um, last question then is is what's the question? One question you get asked most frequently by salespeople. Yeah, it, it's um, what is you know what email should I send out? What what's what tools should I use? What it's kind of like a version of every. I guess everyone wants an easy answer to a complex problem, right? So, like, what's the best cold email I should send? How about that? That, that one's a, a one that I get all the time. And what do you tell them? Um, I tell them the one that is most relevant to them, right? So it, it's, it kind of goes back to what we were saying, doing the, the research and making it relevant to someone. So there's, there's no one cold email that's going to get opened by everyone. There's no magic email, right? No, there's no silver bullet. There's no silver bullet. So do your research and figure out what's going to speak to them. And test it. To, yeah, and, and, and exactly. And test it, right. All right. Well, good. Well, Brandon, thanks for joining me. Um, Brandon Redlinger, Head of Growth at Persist IQ. So how can people find out more about Persist IQ? Yeah, it's just PersistIQ.com, and we keep a regular blog, too, that has a lot of great information for salespeople out there. It's just PersistIQ.com backslash blog, um, and you can also follow us at PersistIQ on the Twitter. All right, the Twitter. <laughs> All right, so again, thanks. And remember, friends, make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new to help you accelerate your success and making Accelerate part of your daily routine is an easy way to do that. Then you'll make sure you don't miss any of my conversations with top business experts like my guest today, Brandon Redlinger, who shared his expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks for joining us. Until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guests, visit my website at andypaul.com.